Good morning, everyone. Let's pray together, shall we? Our loving Heavenly Father, who sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to come and redeem your people and bring us home, please uh, refresh us, strengthen us, encourage us, help us, please, to see what you are doing, that we might have our eyes open to the world the way you see it and to delight in all that is good and holy and right that you are doing in us and for us and in our community for Jesus' sake. Amen. Been in a slightly odd place this morning. I wonder what is the anaesthetic for your soul? Neil Postman in his 1985 book Amusing Ourselves to Death predicted a, a, a fat, comfortable West would be sent to sleep by trivial entertainments. Aldous Huxley's Brave New World saw something similar. And even way back into the mid-17th century, Blaise Pascal observed that men would rather risk death by going to war than sit at home and contemplate death. We'd rather do anything than listen to the silent scream of our souls as it shouts, Is this it? Who am I? Why am I here? Where are we going? What what happens when we die? What's the point? What's the anaesthetic for your soul that silences that voice? Those educated people with sort of slightly left of centre political views live on Twitter outrage and designer coffees, don't they? Others uh, live on Netflix, which is so ubiquitous that their CEO said recently that their main comp- competitor is sleep. And the truth is that for many people, the thoughts that come to mind as you're about to go off to sleep can be so disturbing that many would rather stare at yet another film at three o'clock in the morning and fall asleep with those images going in, distracting us. When I was growing up, we had four TV channels, but the TV was on from the moment we got home from school at sort of half past three until we went to bed at night. And today, there's Spotify and Facebook and 24-hour rolling news, and you have them all in your pocket if you want to, so that on the bus and in the doctor's waiting room, they're there. Put your headphones in, you're distracted. You never have to give your mind a quiet moment ever again. You never need to listen to the voice inside saying, who are you and why are you here? I think that that unwillingness to listen to those questions and demand meaningful answers is is a form of self-harm. We've made ourselves deaf and blind, taken out our eyes, spiritually speaking, made ourselves unable to hear or to see properly. And so we filled life with triviality that has nothing meaningful to say. And that's a theme in Isaiah. So think of chapter 6. God says to Isaiah, Go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. And that's really the situation in verses 5 and 6. Isaiah here is looking forward to God's people in exile in Babylon. And it isn't that they're physically blind and deaf, it's that they are spiritually blind. And because of this blindness, they can't really understand the world in which they live, which leaves them with fear. Which again is a thing we've thought a lot about in the pandemic, isn't it? And our passage today is therefore a tonic for that aching soul. A word to open up eyes, unstop deaf ears, bring strength to the weak and courage to tired hands. It's a passage full of present joys and future glory. And it offers a great hope to those who are not yet trusting in Jesus. It's a story in three parts. It begins in spiritual slave shanty town on the edge of Babylon where Jesus sets the prisoners free. That's verses 3 to the halfway through verse 6. 3 to 6a. So verse 3. Strengthen the feeble, steady the knees. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not Fear, those are your commands in the passage. Their situation in exile appeared to be hopeless, but it isn't. Help is coming. Your God will come. He will come to save you. 
the promise of of rescue brings present hope and strength to those who are still oppressed. But what does the rescue look like? Verse 5. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. All that spiritual self-harm pictured here as physical brokenness will be reversed. They've refused to listen to God and they've ended up in exile. But he is coming to them to open their eyes, to rescue them, to bring them out of slavery. I want to jump on in the Bible a little bit, to Luke chapter 7 for just a moment. John the Baptist sends uh, his disciples to Jesus to find out who he is, and Jesus says, go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. Uh, The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. What's the question? John, who do you think that Jesus is? You look at Jesus' healing ministry and you see the blind seeing and the lame jumping up and you realise here is the rescuer. Of course, often in Jesus' ministry, the healings, especially the sight-giving healings, are a picture of hidden spiritual restoration. Those who were, were blind can see who Jesus is and in their joy they follow him. But the way Isaiah frames this suggests there has to be more, doesn't there? For the blindness of the people brought judgment and slavery and exile. So too their sin has brought them into slavery to death. That's the punishment they have to face. And yet uh, this rescuer comes, not only to open their eyes, but to to create a redeemed people. Verse 9. Now when you redeem something, you pay a price to buy it. Uh, How did Jesus redeem his people? Well, using his blood. Jesus' death paid a price we could never pay by satisfying the judgment against all our sins. Be strong. Your God has come to save you. So Jesus comes to set us free, free from sin and death, and free, freeing our eyes and our ears so that we can, we can ask the right questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where are we going? And he does so in order that we can see the universe in the way that he does, with his eyes, as it were. He shows us the truth about the world through the scriptures, and by his spirit makes them real to our hearts. Jesus is God come to free people. He's continuing to set people free today. The story of the church, which begins uh, in, uh, in Jesus' ministry, has carried on through 20 centuries, millions of people all over the world following Jesus. Every day, new people joining the church. But freedom from sin and death, the giving sight to the blind soul, quieting our fears, strengthening our hands, all this is just chapter one of a quite magnificent story. And we'll come back to think about that in just a moment.